Good. All right. Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us for our class on soteriology, this long word that is just focusing on our salvation. There are a few things in life that we should be thrilled about. This is definitely one of them. And um, this is coming from uh, a book written by Dr. Leighton Talbert, What Does the Bible Say About Salvation? It's part of our Grace Group series. It's really trying to help us understand better what the Bible teaches about important topics, important doctrines in Christianity, specifically the Bible, or specifically the Bible's talking about salvation. So this is a wonderful thing for us to give attention to. I'll pray for us, uh, and then we'll have a few introductory ideas, and we'll continue on looking at the different scenes of salvation. And we're just going to continue glorying in what God has done for us in saving us. So why don't you pray with me to start out here. Lord Jesus, we... Uh, we praise you that you have offered deliverance to us and salvation. And so now because of that, as we have trusted in you, we've been converted. Now we are saved, but also we are safe. Uh, and we're secure uh, in your umbrella of salvation. We praise you for what you have done for us on the cross. We praise you that this has been the plan all along. And we praise you how your death, uh, bring so many glorious effects to us uh, once we trust in you. Please grow our love for you and our faith in you because of our time considering these ideas this morning. Teach us, open our eyes, uh, and help us to glory more in your gospel message. In Jesus' name, amen. Question for you. How many types of fir trees are there? Twelve. Twelve. And eh. Higher. How many kinds? 17 times? like identifiable kinds? types, just with your eyeball. You can identify 17 types of fir trees. Do you know that? Can you? I cannot. I can barely tell what's a fir tree. I think it's like an evergreen category, right? But there are, people are amazingly detailed at this. How many languages are spoken in India by over 1 million people? Like, let's give a qualifier. There's like over 400 total. But how many spoken by a million or more people in just the country of India? Well, I know that in Italy there's like over like a few hundred languages. Yeah. Dialects. So yeah. So yeah. we're not talking dialects. We're talking like people groups over a million speak this language. Over a million speak 40. one language. Yes. Seventy-two. Oh, uh, wow. We're so optimistic. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. But I, I do not know those languages at all. There's a point to this. Um, how many types of formatting for research papers? <laughs> We all sh shudder at this, right? There is a bunch, too many, frankly. MLA, APA, Chicago, Turabian are the, the favorites. And if you get those wrong, there are points off, depending on how much of a stickler your teacher is. I I'm raising all these topics to help us rem remind ourselves there are things in life that we can give a lot of attention to and be an expert on. We have a few people in our church, at least one person in our church who has a doctorate in entomology the study of insects. And she needs to have that doctorate because she, she and her husband both work with uh, kind of bug species that come in through JFK, the international airport, and they need to identify the types of bugs coming in. How do you interact with them if they're gonna be kind of an invasive species? Um, is it a threat at all? I think you have to know this stuff, but I'm thankful I don't have to know those things. I'm not familiar with fir trees, though someone is, and I'm sure there's a linguist who can speak dozens of languages or even, this is the most amazing thing of all, they understand formatting of citations and like details in a, in a research paper, right? But we all should be experts on some, the same thing. As believers, we've made this point last week, we should love and just enjoy considering the details of our salvation. This is a glorious thing, brothers and sisters. So as we spend time in this recap, reminding ourselves of, of what salvation is, this is something that we just really wanna enjoy and relish. We're considering the, tr the God's act of saving our souls and transforming us. And this is something that we want to continue just delighting in, right? So we're recapping. We're kind of bringing ourselves up to speed, similar with last week. We've spent time chronologically looking at the beginning of the story and why we need salvation. We've spent time looking at Jesus' death on the cross and what he has done for us in chapter 2. And then we spend time looking at our role of, of conversion, repenting and trusting in Jesus. And now we're also just exploring some of the, the glorious dynamics of this salvation and what it is. And we use this picture uh, of an umbrella to help us understand different aspects to it. Right? 
and we said in this umbrella there are different parts to it there's this center little shaft thing there's the handle and the mechanism that pops the umbrella open and there are all these little ribs and pieces of the umbrella and then there's the fabric over the whole thing right we use that to help us make sense of salvation what was the the center piece if you can remember what's the core of our salvation like the essence of it Nailed it. Yeah, the death of Jesus on the cross. We've used the word atonement to kind of summarize his death on the cross and what he has done. And because of Jesus' death on the cross, so much hangs on that one event. But it doesn't really pop open until something happens here. What's the, what's the idea there of like popping it open? Conversion. Conversion. Nailed it. And then everything else is all the ribs. <laughs> And so we spent time looking last week at some, we've spent time in the atonement conversion, we looked at some of the effects, we'll, start, we'll review those in a moment. Um, but we want to appreciate this. When Jesus died on the cross, that was a moment in history when now he has taken the sins of the world, he has paid for those sins, he has propitiated the Father, it's one of the things we talked about last week. And then now, at a certain point in history when we believe, then all these effects apply to us. It's a glorious thing for us to consider. Um, and it's even, we can spend time thinking through, like, how does, like, my believing now uh, match or uh, start into effect the actions of Jesus in the past? But it does. And that's, I think that's safe to say that's a mystery that we could leave in the mind of God, but we can glory in at the same time. And so we've been spending time on the, the, the side effects, not side effects, it's like a, a medication um, you know drowsiness maybe let's say the ripple effects I drop a stone in a brook and you're going to see that circle of the water's not moving right but it's the wave the movement that that's working its way out from that center circle here's Jesus dying on the cross here's my believing in him what are the ripple effects how does it affect us how has it affected God himself we spent time with that so um We'll give it, just to summarize the three things, we spent time looking at propitiation, and what's the scene? Help, help us think through that again. It's a nice green icon. <laughs> the temple. So the temple's there. The sacrifice there. These are the sacrifices the day of atonement. that the priest would offer uh, on the Day of Atonement to atone for the sins of the people. All the sins are on the sacrifice. Blood is drained out. God's wrath poured out on that sacrifice. And then that blood is, is sprinkled on the mercy seat as a sign that is covering and, and addressing the problem of those sins. And we've spent time considering that, that God is the one that is being propitiated in that scenario. And because of that, then he can justify us in the legal sense before the judge were declared not only not guilty, but actually righteous. And that's, that's a whole different dimension than we typically would see in the legal system. The legal system is to determine whether someone is guilty or not guilty. The legal system doesn't determine if someone's perfect, like the, the opposite. But in God's court, remind me, I, I can't just be not guilty. I need to be perfect to come into his holy, glorious presence. And he does that. He declares us righteous and, and complete. And how is that possible? Well, it's because the idea of imputation, this financial concept, God's um, willingness and, and his justice to apply one person's credit or debit to another person's account. So as Adam's sin and guilt applies to all of us, his descendants, so our sin applies to Jesus when he accepts all of our guilt and righteousness, and so his righteousness applies to our account as well. And in, in, the, in the, the legal um, setting of God's justice, this is fair. We spent time looking at that last week. What we'll spend time on this week is, is, is uh, some more of these side effects. How does this affect us personally? And this is really, we can appreciate this. And in order to enjoy this, we want to remind ourselves of, of the main problem. We'll get to that in a moment. The first one we'll look at is the idea of forgiveness. We want to enjoy this concept that God, when saving us, has forgiven us. And we'll, what we're going to do now is look through some verses. And as we consider those verses, um, we're going to, try to answer a few key questions that help us make sense of this. Uh, before we look at those verses, the icon is like a, a washing machine, right? A laundromat. And so somehow forgiveness is going to be tied to this idea 
that there's a cleaning effect. There's a removal effect here uh, when we consider forgiveness. So we'll ask three questions as we go throughout uh, our these verses. What is forgiven? When is it forgiven? And maybe we could say on what basis or how is it forgiven? And so they have four different verses we'll be looking at here to really help us appreciate this. Ephesians 1 is a rich passage, a really rich passage. And Paul is kind of surveying a lot of different aspects of our salvation. I'll read the, this first verse and then a heads up I'll, I'll, and someone to read the second verse, the second passage for us in a moment here. Paul says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In him, it's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. We'll give to attention to redemption later on. Here's the emphasis now, forgiveness of our trespasses. And, and on what basis is that? Well, it's by the riches of his grace. And this is a grace that God has just lavished on us as his people. An astounding level of blessing and grace that God has shown us. So what is forgiven? Kind of clear, right? So trespasses, these actions that we've done against God. When is it forgiven? Hmm. Not really told directly, although we reference his blood, so that may be part of it. On what basis? Why can God or why would God forgive us? Maybe you're seeing that, that idea, the riches of God's grace, His grace, His generous heart, His willingness to do what we don't deserve, to offer what we don't deserve. It is a rich grace. It is a rich grace that God gives to us. All of His resources available to us. Um, and uh, the idea of lavish is wonderful as well. Ben, can you read this next passage for us from Colossians chapter 2? And we'll kind of sort through and ask these questions again. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all the transgressions, having canceled mm -hmm. out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. Mm -hmm. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. There's a lot packed in this section, right? So when we are dead in our transgressions and the uncircumcision of our flesh. flesh. So here's this, this concept, right? This, this person who's dead, they're, they're separate from the life of God. Our sins were just completely banished from his life-giving presence. And then he makes us alive. He brings this dead corpse back to life with Jesus. And now what is built into that idea of being made alive? Well, he talks about a couple things. Most clearly, he's forgiven us. What is forgiven? Just enjoy that word all. All of our transgressions. All our acts of crossing the line, of breaking God's moral law, failing to live up to his perfect standard. Every time we sin against God with our thought, a proud impulse, a lustful desire, this moment of anxiety and not trusting God and like suspecting everybody around us, every action that is sinful, all of those transgressions are forgiven. They are completely removed. And then he adds on to that idea of the transgression because then you have, you're in the economic sector, right? You have the certificate of debt. There's this decree against it. Here's a list of all the charges that, should, that apply to that person's account. And what is God going to do with that, that whole list of charges? He's taken it, right? And he's applied it somewhere else. He's nailed it to the cross. What a vivid word picture, right? Our Lord Jesus nailed to the cross, and then he becomes sin. All of our sin is nailed to that cross. That, certi that list that would be put in public, kind of posted on the community bulletin board, Here, here's this person's wanted for these crimes, right? Boom, posted in public right there on the cross. And it's, it's developing this hostility between us and our God. And now God has taken it out of the way. It's such a, a glorious picture of forgiveness. And he's nailed it to the cross. 
And maybe you're thinking about this. Um, I'm reminded, I was reminded of the song, My Jesus Fair, that our church sings sometimes. You may recognize some of the words from this verse. My Jesus kind was torn by nails, by nails of cruel men, and to his cross as grace prevailed, God pinned my wretched sin. And so the author's making this point. As Jesus is nailed by evil men doing an unjust act, God uses that platform to now pin my own list of sins right there on that same cross. And because of that, all of my transgressions are forgiven. Well, two more passages here. <coughs> Pastor Tim, do you mind reading for us from Hebrews chapter 9? And then Paul, I'll have you read the last one in a moment as well. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So the Hebrew, the writer to the Hebrews is kind of referencing the Old Testament law and the blood sacrifices. And Jesus is that ultimate blood sacrifice. And he's kind of summarizing this, this topic. And he's saying, really, you could say it this way. Um, it's like the blood is cleaning us. <laughs> the blood cleans us. And so if there's no blood available, there's no forgiveness, right? So you're seeing that laundromat idea. This forgiveness of sins, it's, it's removed, it's wiped away, it's, the charges are dismissed. There's no base at all for that case anymore um, because of this blood. So when is this forgiven? Well, we're definitely looking at the blood now of Jesus because Jesus died on the cross. That blood is a laundry detergent. You know, I want to say that reverently. But in a sense, it, 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 this blood is like the cleansing agent. And we'll look at another verse here in a moment that, that explores that some more. And it is really wonderful because blood typically doesn't clean things. It stains things, right? Blood gets on someone's garment. It's really hard to get it out unless you catch it right away. And yet this blood is the means of our forgiveness. Um, Paul, you mind reading this last verse then? 1 John chapter 1. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we could jump to the when question. When is this forgiveness available? If we do something, right? If we confess. I want to clarify here. This is John writing to believers, and he includes himself in this we. So this is not saying like forgiveness like the first time I trust in Jesus. This is like my pattern as a Christian. Even if we as believers confess our sins. Um, what about God? Well, we want to base our understanding on the character of God. That's always the foundation. What do we know about God? He is faithful. He has declared something. He will always keep his word. He does not change. He is consistent, trustworthy, predictable, stable. When I approach my father and confess this sin, he is faithful. He will always respond the same way. And he's righteous, too. He doesn't just say, you know what, all right, right here. Just sweep it under the rug so no one finds out. He, he doesn't uh, ignore things. We spent time in a family conference yesterday afternoon, and one of the sessions was about in a relationship how it's easy to hurt someone else, whether intentional or unintentional, and how do you address it. And the speaker was just helping us sort through, when do I bring it up and be honest about I was hurt by this? Or when do I you know, just kind of ignore it and overlook it and move on? And, and that's, that's a conversation worth having. But he just made the point that there are times we're supposed to bring something up and neither party wants to go through the effort of sorting through it. And so we're just going to pretend it's not there. And he just made the point that that's not true reconciliation. That's not addressing it. That's just ignoring it. That's avoiding it. It's going to take courage. It's going to take effort and, and humility and investment to talk it through. So it's easy for us to kind of avoid that. But I love that God is righteous. Yeah, Paul, what you had today? Um, in that video of Leighton Talbert you sent me, he was, uh, I liked something that he had said. Um, he was talking about all the covenants that God had, had made. Hmm. And it was just, it was obvious that these were eventually going to come to an end. And then God says in, in his word, he says, you know, this is going to be an everlasting covenant. This is going to be without end. You know, his reign is going to be without end. So this is, you know, we're reading, you know, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness if we confess our sins. Hmm. So, you know, we can rest assured that he will, like you said, keep his promise. Mm -hmm. So this is not like conditional and there's something better to come. Yeah. And that's so important for us. We'll, we'll spend some time in a moment here thinking about the implications for us, right? Uh, but this is wonderful. And, and I didn't have it on the screen, but it's worth looking at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. We walk in the light as if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light. Two things happen. 
We have fellowship with each other. I'm trying to please God. I'm a, I'm, I can be on speaking terms with every Christian around me. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Really matches this concept of forgiveness. So we can say, what is being forgiven? We're summarizing these topics then. One thing we would say is, it's, it's my sins against God. And we've summarized this. God is a judge and he's a personal judge. So in one sense, there's this legal aspect to my sin, but also this personal aspect. I've personally insulted this glorious judge. And he's righteous in, 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 in giving me a verdict and the sentence even. Um, but amazingly, because of his love and his faithfulness and his righteousness, he will address my sin while also dismissing the sin from my charge. When is that forgiveness? Well, in one sense, it's at, the, it's at the death of Jesus. It's based on the death of Jesus and his blood. And also, it's assuming that I'm repenting. And then even as a believer, I'm confessing again and again, right? It's not automatic. We'll spend time kind of sorting through that, confessing to God after I'm a Christian. But like, is he, you know, what's, am, I, am I in danger of being unforgiven and, and losing eternal life? What does that look like? We'll talk about that in a moment and even more in weeks to come. I'm going to touch really quickly, don't be overwhelmed by this next slide, but there are several Old Testament word pictures that I really just enjoyed kind of sorting through, and I'll just post them here for us. We talked about the Day of Atonement. One goat was killed for the sins of the people, and the other one is kind of just released into the wilderness. They're the scapegoat, and I just love that word, that picture. All right, all the sins go on this one, be gone. You're out. And never to be brought back into the camp again. My sins are on that goat, right? And Hebrews identifies Jesus with that scapegoat. He's crucified. He's led outside the camp to die for my sins. So, like, that doesn't apply. Same thing with Psalm 103. You have these different points of the compass. If I'm going in the eastern direction and someone's going west, this is metaphorical, right? Don't say, well, technically the earth is a globe. And because of gravity, if you go there, you're going to be, we just want to see the general directions, right? If I'm going one direction, my sin is going the opposite direction. We'll never meet again. We're going away from each other. It's just a glorious concept. My sin is not attached to me anymore. Micah 7, um, toward the end of that section, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Like, all right, give me that, li- that, that list of things. Crumple the paper, stomp on it, and then he'll throw our sins into the depths of the sea. Just getting rid of it completely. Just really showing the totality, the finality of this. When God declares my sins forgiven, he doesn't drop a hook and try to find that list of ordinances at the bottom of the sea. It's gone forever. He has officially removed it. Or what was a new verse to really spend time in for me was Isaiah 44. I've wiped out transgressions like what? Cloud. Or your sins like this mist, right? So I'm picturing fog or the sky of clouds. You've been in that, that the, the type of weather where you're walking out and it's misty out, right? Or you're, you're looking at this really cool cloud in the sky. Hey, look, it's a puppy! Or, wow, a battleship, Battlestar Galactica, something. Give it a few minutes, that fog dissipates. You can't recondense the fog again. When that cloud shifts shape or it floats away, I can't kind of pull it back and reform it. Once it dissipates, it's gone. And there's no way of bringing it back together and keeping it. A really wonderful word picture that describes this. So you can see it, but see through it, and then there's no substance to it. Substance to it. God's yeah, we could, we could really explore that. I think his main point is when you remove the cloud, it's gone. That's it. You know, um, you can't recondense it and bring up the charges again. So let me just raise this question for us that because God forgives our sins completely, permanently, um, what, how, what are some um, lies that we could tend to believe? And this helps to address those lies. Does that make sense? There are some things I could tend to believe. For instance, let's give one example. God um, won't forgive my sins. That's a simple lie we can believe. How would that address? I've done too much. Okay. Yeah. So that sin was 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 the last time that um, that was one above the quota, right? God doesn't have enough riches of grace to forgive that sin too. So that's kind of funny, but we can think that way, right? Or even feel that way. What are some other examples how this forgiveness could really help us? Give us an example how to forgive others. 
We could talk about that. Yeah. I can't forgive that person. You know all the things they did against me? And that's, that's I, I want to be gracious and delicate how we sort th through that, right? I'll just make the point. When God is saying these things, he's, and this is important to remember, forgiveness is not, it's not the category of emotion. I feel like forgiving this person. It's not even the category of memory. Like, I, I don't remember what happened. What are you talking about? It, it's the category of the will. I choose not to bring this up. I intentionally choose to leave it in the past and dismiss it. That doesn't apply to the situation. What I have forgiven, that's it. That's really challenging for us as humans to do that. But it, it's helpful when we consider what God has done for us and how he has officially, completely, in totality, taken this whole list of long offenses against him personally, taken it and dismissed it. And, and through Jesus, all of those offenses have been addressed. Um, and then he will forgive us and not hold anything against us. Some we'd say, sometimes we could say, I can't forgive myself. And that that's, can be a little hairy language because we don't need, you know, technically we're not the judge. <laughs> but I think there's a sense in which we can't, like, I can't believe I did this in the past. And so my past haunts me. I think that's what people mean when they say something like forgive yourself, right? It's helpful to see that God has forgiven me and he doesn't hold my past against me. And so I don't have to live in the past to be trapped by it either, right? I learn from it, of course, but I don't live in it. And Paul had that same mentality in Philippians 3. I, I forget the things behind me. I'm not running looking backwards. Or as my son was uh, riding his bike earlier this morning here at the church office, he was checking to see something as he was riding his bike, which means when you turn your head and you're riding, what's going to happen? I'm like, bro! There's no other cars on the road, but did you see how easily you swerved to this side? Don't ride forward looking back. That's not wise. I'm going to keep moving forward, right? Because God is doing that with me. Uh, and so these are the helpful things we can talk through. Let me move forward really quickly. Uh, another glorious picture is the idea of redemption. Buying back, buying out of slavery. Really powerful word picture. Um, and we'll kind of tease it out. So we'll ask a few questions as we, as we look at key scriptures. They're the questions. Who is the one doing the redeeming? Um, what is the cost of redemption? Who is being redeemed? And are, what are they being redeemed from? That's the idea. And it's more than just I lost an item and someone found it and sold it at the pawn shop and I see it at the pawn shop and I have to buy it back. There's like this this personal element. There's there's like a uh, they're not the, the the item that I lost is just sitting on the shelf. But if it's a person who's being redeemed, it's like they're they're on sale. It's terrible. They have chattel slavery, and so there's this this horrific background to this context. But then to see what God has done in redeeming us, this makes it more glorious too. So let's look at some verses here, and we'll try to sort through this idea of redemption. Alex, do you mind reading this first verse for us? Oh, yeah. Same um, thing from Ephesians one. In Him we have redemption. Blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he, he lavished on us. So who is redeem who is redeeming? Hmm. Well it's not us. <laughs> That's easy, right? We're the ones being redeemed. We have this transaction, right? What do you think about that? Jesus is the one doing the redeeming. What is the price? Through his blood. We'll give more attention to that here. I'll read this next set of verses from 1 Peter 1. Peter says, Knowing this, you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with what? What were you redeemed with? Precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless. The blood of Christ. So we are being redeemed by God, right? What is, what is being paid? What's the cost involved here? Life for life, that's great. Yeah, blood, like the life of one person for the life of another person. And uh, it's funny how Peter's like, it's not something cheap like silver and gold. Eh. Money, finances, that's not as valuable, right? It's, it's perishable. 
interest applies, or no, inflation applies, so eventually the, the value of that amount goes down. <coughs> we're, we're, we're bought, we're redeemed, here's the price, precious blood, like someone's life. And we remember this is the life of Jesus, the Son of God. So God declares us worth buying, worth redeeming. How valuable are you and I? We are infinitely valuable to God. He'd be willing to give up even the life of his own beloved son for us. Um, and this can be a huge, this can apply to like our self-esteem challenges, right? I'm nothing, I'm not valuable. You know what God says? I declare you infinitely valuable. How many, I love you so much, I would give up my own son for you. To claim you, to redeem you. We're redeemed from what? Hmm. He describes it as like this futile way of life, inherited from our forefathers. So here he's talking to people, many of them are Gentiles, right? Our ancestors were pagans. They were not following God, and they had this futile pattern of living that I was going to naturally follow. And he says, listen, I bought you out of that slavery to a futile way of life. I'm going to buy you out of that life, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you now as mine. And we'll explore that, that idea in a moment here. This is wonderful, guys. <clears throat> if Jesus hadn't bought me, I'm trapped. I'm enslaved to maybe a pattern of living um, that would not lead me to God for sure. Another glorious verse. Ben, you mind reading this? Revelation 5. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain. Purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So, um, who are they addressing? Who are they singing to? Christ. Christ, right? This lamb, the imagery in Revelation. He is worthy to take a book and break its seals. Really fascinating background culturally, right? This is like essentially the title deed of earth. Who can claim the earth? Um this special scroll that unleashes righteous judgment and results in a new heaven, a new earth. Who is the only one? Well, this one is. Why? Because he was slain and he has purchased with his blood for God. Whom? This is wonderful. This huge multi-ethnic international um, group of people. And so you have all these people, this international crowd, praising God. I want to be clear here, Revelation 5. At this point, I think it's uh, 24 elders. So this is not a whole international crowd, but at the same time, uh, yeah, 24 elders in chapter 5, verse 8. They're the ones singing, and it's, it's most likely just seeing these are kind of summarizing the, the, the believers throughout the ages. And so you have all these people praising God. You are worthy. You are worthy to be praised because you have purchased us. You've claimed us for yourself. I'm kind of summarize a few other core ideas. And it's important to sort this through, right? First of all, we're free from something. Um, Hebrews references this as well. Um, but it, it doesn't sound like the, the, the original master is Satan. It's not like Satan is the master. Sometimes we could have that idea like Satan versus God. Um kind of binary factors. Um, but if we look at Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 13, and chapter 4, verse 5, Titus chapter 2, Hebrews 2 I mentioned, it's more like I'm enslaved to the sinful pattern of living. Or Galatians says, I'm, I'm a slave to the law. This harsh master, I can never do enough. And because I'm under this harsh master, I'm doomed. And I'm afraid of dying. Hebrews 2 really spends time in that idea. And so I'm stuck never being able to satisfy this harsh, vindictive master. It's a terrible word picture in our minds. But now because Jesus has bought us, we're free from that. We're free from that evilness and that violence. And it's worth noting as well, it doesn't mean we're independent or autonomous. Woohoo, now I can do what I want, right? Because here's the challenge. If I'm free... If I think I'm free to do whatever I want, what will I start doing? I'll go back to this same original slave master. Now I'm free to do whatever I want, which usually turns into sin, which means I'm actually still enslaved. 
And so the idea is I'm not actually free to do whatever I want. I'm free to serve God. And there's a part of us, especially in the, I guess the backdrop of chattel slavery, like the idea of any master just makes us recoil at that, right? Because it's natural for us to distrust the people above us, right? Any kind of authority. Unless it's God. And this is where it's, it's a joy to serve God. Now, Jesus is clear as well in John chapter 15. He says, I don't just call you servants. I call you friends. So it's more than just this like master-slave relationship. We're his family. We're his children. But he is still very much the Lord. And we still very much submit to him and obey him because he has the authority. But he is a good king. He is a benevolent dictator. Right? Sounds kind of funny. <laughs> but he always has our best interests in mind and he gives us all the resources we need and he walks with us and he gives us the coaching tips and he's going to be like, like a, this uh, you know, personal assistant all along the way walking us through whatever things he would assign to us. And he's done it ahead of us. He says, follow me. He doesn't say, go do it. Follow me. I already did this. And so in that case, our response then is, is oh, I can't wait to serve this God. And two patterns I'll mention. One, after Israel comes out of Egypt, when God sets up his covenant with them at Sinai, he says, I, I bought you from slavery to Egypt, so then you would serve me. Really just a sweet claiming them so that they would worship him in response. And then you have this really powerful picture of Gomer and Hosea. He, Hosea is the prophet of God. God tells him to marry Gomer, um, knowing that very soon she's not going to be faithful to that marriage, and she's going to be pregnant by other people. Um, and yet Hosea is told, do this. He does, and, and so now she has three different children. None of them, he's not the dad of any of them. But she's in the home, and he's just seeing, oh, she's pregnant again. Oh, Cut to the heart. God, name them, these children, claim them as your own. Um, and there are object lessons, and, and this is just a depiction of Israel's relationship to God. Well, toward the end of the story, Gomer, she, even then, she's not even satisfied to live in the house anymore. She just runs away. And then Hosea eventually finds her, uh, but now she's for sale as a slave. It's a terrible kind of pattern that she's in. And then... Hosea is told, now you need to buy her so you can make her your own wife again. And so he buys her to free her from this terrible life that she had found herself in. Uh, kind of the, the bottom of the slope where she never expected to be. And now Hosea claims her, not as a slave, but as a wife. And a really beautiful pattern of God redeeming us. Not to be harsh toward us, but to be gracious and kind. We have a good God who would redeem us. That in mind, <coughs> um, we could spend, I wish we had more time to talk about the lies, but maybe I'll suggest two lies. Number one, sometimes I could begin to think, I have to do this sin. I have to sin. This sin, this is who I am. And I've done it my whole life, and I can't say no. Well, as a believer, God has redeemed us from sin. I don't have to sin. He gives a way of escape. His spirit is right here. Now, it doesn't mean it's easy, but it's possible. By God's grace, I don't have to sin. Another uh, lie we may tell, ourself, tell ourselves is, I don't have to serve God. Eh, serving God is optional, as long as I get to heaven. Right? In our selfishness, we sometimes think this way. And God says, careful, careful. As soon as you refuse to serve me, you're going to be, you're going to revert back to your original slave master of the law and sinful desires. Don't go down that path. Really rich. Last one we'll touch on quickly, reconciliation. This is two people being reconciled together. Who, who used to be, well, I don't want to say everything. I want the scripture to teach us what reconciliation means. So let's just look at some verses here. Romans 5, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And later in that same chapter, he just makes this point. While we were enemies, we used to be enemies, but now we're reconciled to God through the death of his son. And much more, having been reconciled, now not just that, there's this reconciliation, this absence of hostility. Now we're going to be saved by his life, his resurrection. Not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received this reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is just summarizing this gospel message that he's been charged to proclaim everywhere. All these things are from God. What has God done? He has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and now he's given us that ministry of reconciliation. 
namely that God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And then he has committed to us the same word. One more passage, Colossians 1. You were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, and yet now God has reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So what's the problem that reconciliation is addressing? What's the issue? Okay, so there's this relationship. It's broken, right? Um, who needs to be reconciled? Well, from the verses, it's, this is kind of focusing on us, right? And, and this, can, this makes sense, right? So there's this perfect relationship with God, Adam and Eve. It's broken, and now the creatures, the, the humanoids, us, we're like hostile toward this God, suspicious of him, um, resentful. Can't believe he tells me what. Who does he think he is? Well, he's God. <laughs> but there's this part of us that can just pushes back against him. Oh, you're telling me what to do? Oh, and you're saying you have the right to? Mm, there's this part of us that just bristles at that, right? There's this hostility. I love what God tells me not to love. That's going to get personal really easily. Um, and notice it's not saying God is hating me. God is not hostile toward me. He is angry at sin, and, and, and there's a righteous anger there. But, but God's disposition is one of love. So you would say if this is a two-way street, I need to be reconciled to God. What has God done? And this is a concept from last week. What has God done to, to allow me to be reconciled? This is that word propitiation. God, his end of the deal is righteous anger. My end of the deal is hostility, sinful hostility. Both of those are addressed. So now we can meet. How does it happen? Well, we're pointing to the cross of Christ again. At the cross of Christ, there's this glory where all the anger of man is poured out on this innocent victim. Right? The most violent form of death, all the hatred and the hypocrisy and just the despising that people had toward Jesus. And so he's absorbing all of our anger and blasphemy and hostility and just vite, despite right on him. And then God pours out his wrath on Jesus at the cross. So at that point of intersection is where we can have reconciliation. And in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, he's not counting our trespasses against us. And this is the amazing thing. What's the result then? I'm no longer hostile. What, what's the effect? All right? Peace. Even love. Even holy and blameless. No level of, like, accusation. Um... God declares me completely clean and forgiven. I've got nothing to hide from him. There's this integrity in the relationship. When we think about standing before Jesus Christ very, very, very soon, we've got nothing to be afraid of. I can't wait to stand before you, O oh Lord. Not saying I'm perfect, but I'm at peace. There's no more hostility or resentment or, or suspicion toward our God. So we just summarize all these glorious pictures put together, right? They're wonderful. What would be some lies that this can help me address? I'm going to go back to that, that reconciliation. Uh, what are some lies? Maybe I'll su suggest to one, sometimes we could think, I can't go back to God. I can't go back. I've sinned too much. Think of the prodigal son, right? I'm stubborn. I'm on this path. To turn around and go back would be so embarrassing. It would be so humiliating. I'd be, I would have to admit that I'm wrong, and it's not easy to do that. And I'm kind of on this this pattern and I'm kind of numb already in my conscience. I can't go back. And yet you read the account of the prodigal son. What's the father doing? He is eagerly looking. Please, please come back. He's just waiting and then he sees this, the, the son in the distance. He runs toward him and just hugs him. Big old bear hug. And it's so humiliating and it's so wonderful when we're broken like that. And we come to God in full repentance. Um, another th lie we could have is that God is angry at me. Um, I deserve this punishment because God hates me right now. We could think that, but that's not true. Because God's heart toward us is one of nothing but love and taking initiative to restore that relationship. Now, he's a father, right? And so, so there are times that we will do things that displease him, grieve him, 
But his response is not anger. Not, not toward his own children. His response is always a loving response. And so because our God always loves us, we can always return. And we should. Why not? What a glory to come back to him like that. Okay. That was a lot of talking. Um, as you have thought through these six different ideas, three last week, three this week, wh- which one, I'm going to ask just a general question, what one is the most impactful, would you say? Which one did you need to hear? <laughs> which one do you most often need to hear from these, these ideas? Yeah, of these six, which one is like most helpful for us? Well, that's that way. I think the one with Hosea. Gomer. Hmm. Just because like repeat offenses, even he, you know, bought us in our filth, hmm. and then even still like we go back to our filth, and then he's even there, just pulling us back out because we're hmm. just not able to do it. And uh, it sets the example uh, and the tone for how we should um, view others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the type of love and grace that we should have for others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, notice the top three are more directly like our relationship with God, but the bottom three can affect our relationship with other people, right? I can follow that example, forgive others. Oh, buying back, maybe not the best picture, but there is a sense of just reconciling, definitely. Um, there, there should be a horizontal implication because God has done this for me. I want to do this toward others. Let me seek peace. Well, let me pray for us. We do. I'm looking at the time. We need to get going here. But let's, uh, let's rejoice in God's goodness. Lord, do you thank you that you have uh, described your salvation in these glorious pictures. Uh, we want to just relish this. And maybe even tonight, later on, we could just spend time in Ephesians 1 and, and let you just lavish on us an understanding of your love and your grace. Um, We, as your people, we are redeemed and claimed by you to serve you. And there are still times we really find ourselves loving that old life and and not really valuing that that restored relationship with you. And, And in those moments when we're embarrassed and we'd rather just keep plugging away in our own stupid sin will you be gracious to us and break us not to destroy us but break us to restore us and thank you then that as your people we can live in peace with others and so grow us in our love for you and our love for others 